Hey everyone, Martin Jagers. Today we're actually welcoming Catherine Finney, who is the managing partner of Genius Guild. Genius Guild is a business creation platform that uses the venture studio model to invest in black entrepreneurs building scalable businesses that serve black communities and beyond. Catherine's background is nothing short of exceptional. And Catherine, I apologize. I'm not going to be able to cover it all in an introduction because yeah. I think we'll be spending <laughs> 10 minutes on it. Yeah, um, that is totally fine. <laughs> but first of all, welcome today and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to look at your beautiful background. Yeah. It's snowing here in Chicago. So you're, you're giving me hope that June will get here soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hear the summers are beautiful there. So I look forward to joining you one day. Yeah. yeah. So just for everyone, this is actually my backyard. This is Brisbane, Australia, um, home of the 2032 Olympics. So uh, it's actually not like that today, but it's still quite warm. So I won't rub it in too much, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, please don't. So just a further introduction, Catherine is the former CEO and founder of Digital Undivide, a groundbreaking social enterprise focused on creating a world where women own their work, which I love because we talked to Catherine and I also talked about my background and also what, Kat, what Catherine is very, very passionate about. Now, there is actually in the introduction, there's a bunch of awards. There's a bunch of acknowledgement with Catherine's profile. So please, and I'll add this into the introduction on the actual channel as well. Um, but the really other exciting thing we're going to talk about today is your new book, Catherine. Uh, build the damn thing how to start a successful business if you're not a rich white guy and so i really look forward to actually sh you, know, you sharing that story with us and, and learning more a bit about how that book and it's actually due to be launched on june 7th this year yes but you yeah. can pre-order it now so it's on uh, amazon cool. perfect and the other side of it Catherine's also got her own podcast uh, of the same name so we'll talk a bit about that as well Catherine. but where i'd love to start is genius skill you know, when, you, when we think about investing into black entrepreneurs and building scalable businesses uh, that serve the black communities, I'd love to learn more about that. And really, what's the force behind it that really drove you doing this? The force is just historically, um, particularly, you know, in America, but not just in America, around the world, mm. um, black communities have really driven innovation. And I always go back to hip hop. And, you know, hip hop came out of communities, communities of color, Black, um, Latino communities mm -hmm. in the South uh, Bronx of New York City. And these, this was a whole genre of music and culture that was created by the fact that people weren't given the same opportunities. Mm -hmm. Literally, you had people who could not afford instruments, so they were using records to create, you know, soundtracks and then rapping and singing over it. And... I think for a lot of us, it would be hard to understand that there wasn't very much investment in hip hop in the very beginning, mm -hmm. for many, many, many years, right? This global idea that fundamentally has changed every corner of the world and people didn't believe in it. They thought it yeah. was a fad. They didn't want to invest in it. And it came directly from black communities. There's other examples. I think when we look at sports, um, you know, I was talking to uh, my son and we were talking it's african-american history month here in the united states yeah. and i said to him you know there was a time where black people couldn't even play basketball mm -hmm. can we imagine that like there was a time yeah. where um the idea was that that black community wasn't smart enough to play basketball yeah. um and so this idea of investing in the community that i come from um is not just you know altruistic and, and sort of charity. It's not charity at all. It's some of the most fundamental ideas in business and life have come from this community. Yes. Um, and, and it's completely changed many, many corners of the globe. Um, I was reading about uh, BTS, the like big Korean like K-pop group. And one of their biggest, biggest, biggest um, inspiration was New Edition, which is an African-American old school R&B group from like the yeah. 80s and 90s. I mean, here's this like incredible like uh, group of, of men, BTS, who have like completely changing music who were inspired by um, Black community. And yeah. in fact, one of the things I read is that they learned a lot about what not to do in business from what yes. happened to New Edition. And BTS is actually 
owners of a startup, which is really interesting. They yeah, own right. the, the, the hit making company that like manages them, which I thought was like absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And so how do you work? How do you decide who to work with? Is it, is it more of a community type working model or is it you work with specific businesses? Well, we do have three sort of core investment categories. Um, one is restructuring the flow of capital. Mm-hmm. We're really interested in um, companies that are using innovation to like rethink how capital flows, yeah. uh, particularly in black communities. Um, we have been historically excluded mm-hmm. from capital markets in the, in the United States and in the globe. And so people who are rethinking how we do it, the use of crypto, yeah. um, blockchain, yeah. you know, NTS, like any of these sort of new yeah. technologies that have come out, really interested in that. Um, the other area we invest in is healthy environments and healthy communities. Mm-hmm. So my background is as an epidemiologist, so I care yeah. a great deal about health. As you can imagine, the past two years, like everything in my life has mm-hmm. converged. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so really excited about that space. And then last but not least is companies that are figuring out how do we stay connected in a very disconnected world. In particularly, how do we stay connected with that we didn't even know. And so we invest in those sort of areas. We also have a real focus on Black founders. Um, and we use Black globally, meaning the entire diaspora. Yes. So, um, as I like to say, we're not doing genetic tests here. If you're yeah. black, that's not yeah. enough for me. Like, <laughs> we're not yeah. going to test yeah. that. But really have a lens because we think this is a really untapped market, untapped, yeah. underserved market, and there's huge amounts of opportunities. Yes, um, yeah. Anyone can pitch us. I always say, like, let me say no. Don't say no for me. So go yes. ahead and pitch. You, you may not know what I'm thinking or what discussions we may have as a team. And you might be in your company may be exactly what we're looking for. Yes, yeah. And so let's talk about, because the beautiful part of really the message that we're trying to get across with this, and yes, it's a sharing community and we're learning from you today, but we really don't look at next-gen leaders as a model that it's for a particular uh, demographic. It's for everyone, whether you're new leaders. Let's, let's focus on startup for a second and, and new leaders. What's some, of the, what's some of the core advice that you give to them to really focus on as they go through that early phase journey? You know, it's so interesting. And I talk a lot about this in my book. Um, when you, it's something about when you are doing what you're supposed to do, when mm. you are letting your light shine, you give permission for other people to do the same. Mm. And it doesn't matter what your race or gender is, other people see it and they get yes. inspired by it. Um, and so by me living my authentic self and being who I am, and I'm really like this in person too, <laughs> like yes. I'm on the yes. page for like, I'm just <laughs> the same person. Um, it has inspired others. And yes. it's been really interesting, the type of people who is inspired. The, um, the intro to my book is written by Guy Kawasaki, mm-hmm. like, you know, who has been a mentor and friend for many, many years, but yep. who's been inspired and, you know, others as yeah, well. Right. And so for new leaders, I always say, you know, a couple of things. It's one, you don't know who's watching you. You don't know who's being inspired by you. So, so keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, two, make sure you create your personal toolbox, which is basically being an entrepreneur is hard, regardless of who you are. It is the hardest yeah. thing to do. It's, it, it might be a lesson in insanity, right? Because, you, and, and maybe I'm a little bit insane because I keep doing it. So, like, is that the definition, definition of insanity? Of something, right? Um, and so you need this personal toolbox. Like you need the foundation, the, the people that's going to help you get through the really hard times. Yeah. And so one of the things I talk about is like, you know, creating your personal advisory board. Yes. Um, and that's so important. It's like, you know, someone who brings levity to a situation because it's going to be really hard. Um, at some point, I was talking to an entrepreneur, at some point, you're going to have to fire someone. Mm-hmm. And it is the worst thing to have to do. I absolutely, it's the thing I hate the most about yeah. everything is to having to do that. And so you're going to need to be able to call someone and who's going to make you feel better. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I love that personal advisory board. Personal advisory board. I also have an enforcer who happens to be my mom. 
And so my mom, to use a phrase from the Liam Nielsen Taken movie, she has a particular skill set that she's developed over the years. Love it. And so, you know, I come from a community that's resource poor. Mm -hmm. So when it's like Catherine's raised this money or Catherine's did this, you know, people will come and ask me for money. My mom is exceptionally talented at saying no. Yes. Um, she likes to say no. I think she, <laughs> she's gotten a certain skill with that. And, you know, she happens to be a 75-year-old year, Black grandma, and no one's going to, like, argue with her. You're not like, going like, yeah, to get one out of her. Yeah. You're not going to get one out of her. So but no is like a final no. It's a no yeah. period. Like, yeah. um, it's a complete sentence. That's and awesome. So, but that's really helpful for me because it helps me to maintain my relationships with those people. Yes. And also for people yeah. to not be like, you know, Catherine's being super mean or whatever. Yes. So it takes that lift, that weight off of me. And yeah. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, we don't think about that before we start. For a lot of leaders, whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, like you don't think about the team that you need to have around you in order for you to do the work that you need to do, yeah. to do it successfully. Yeah. And you really do have to think in that way. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. So have you got some examples of some companies or just actually let, let's focus not companies, leaders. Mm-hmm. That you've seen start just with with a with a simple idea or an idea that you really you coached and sort of mentored through the process, um, and if there's anything there that you you learn out of that exercise or that you know it's not an exercise for you it's life, um, but yeah. is there anything you learn out of that process? Because to me that personal um, what do you call it again? You called it personal advisory board. Oh, I just love it. I need one. I need one, and I'm 49 years old. I need one, you know, and especially the past one, two years. Especially yeah. the past. It's like we all need yeah. one. It's not yeah. just leaders. It's everyone needs one to be able to talk, bounce, and, 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 and not be judged or thought. And then at the end of it, there's something that we can move forward. And it sounds like your mother's very good at that. <laughs> it sounds like you your know, mother's very good people- at that. It doesn't have to be, because when we think of advisory boards, particularly if you're a type A personality, okay, so I've got to get the most top person in this space. It's like, yeah. no, you, you need people who can fulfill certain roles. And that may not be, you know, the high powered CEO. If, that, if it's the high powered CEO, that's great, but it probably won't be. Yes. It may be your mother. Yeah. It may be an assistant. It may be a junior staff member. It may be your wife. It may be your husband. They may, you know, so don't worry about, what the resume of that person is for your mm-hmm. personal advisory mm-hmm. board. It's more the 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 talent, the skill set is more yes. important than the resume. And so knowing having someone on my team, like my mom, who can navigate difficult family members has been quite valuable. It has yes. saved yeah. me a lot of Amazing. mental yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, having friends who are just really funny. I mean, we had like has been so helpful, especially during the pandemic. Um, we have a whole like memes and threads and stuff yeah. like that. It has, and we're all very high powered people, but we're also human beings. And I think yeah. one of the things yeah. I also give to founders is don't lose sight of your humanity. We are human beings. Mm. We need to sleep. We need to eat. We need love. We need hugs. We, we need to decompress. We have bad days and we have great days. Yeah. Um, and don't, get so wrapped up into this founder startup space that you, you lose your humanity. Yes. That you forget that you're a human being. Yes. Um, and that and we're all living this human experience. And yes. so it's one of the big things I say, one of my favorite founders, I have so many founders that are my favorite and everyone we've invested in is like totally my favorite, but um, <laughs> this particular founder, um, her name is B-Law and she has a, company called Quirktastic and they have a app called Quirk Chat. Mm-hmm. It's like TikTok for anime enthusiasts and geeks. It's right. a whole geekdom community. Um, and when I first met her, it was many years ago when I was the CEO of, of Digital Divided and she came in and she was just so quirky. Like she yeah. by by training she's like a crypto psychologist. Right. Like so she was freezing cells and like reanimating them (laughs) and and she just had like she came in like an anime character like her like she had blue hair and she had all this stuff and that's not usually what you see in the startup space particularly at the time that she was when we first met um 
it was very dominated by a certain type of person, right? And anyone outside, and it wasn't just white males. I was saying it was like a very specific type of white guy too. Yes. Like it was, you know, um, a little antisocial, a little <laughs> like, you know, yeah. so, and so here she comes with like this, you know, black woman scientist with like pink hair talking about building this app and talking about her tech stack and getting into this. And you could imagine the response was kind of like, oh my God. But I loved it. Yeah. Um, I loved it because A, she was herself. Yes. And I yeah. always believe that um, you ne- keeping with yourself is just so much easier because once you start to change yourself, you forget who you are and it's very hard to go back to that yeah. point. Love it. And so even if it's painful, even if people don't accept you, it's just so much easier just to be yourself for you. Yes. Yeah. Like it's just easier to maintain. Yes. Um, and so, you know, but we worked together for quite a bit. And at that time I didn't have a fund and I always wanted to invest in her. Um, and in the meantime, she was building on her company. She was in Snapchat's accelerator. She was raising from tech stars and like all yeah. these other folks. Yeah. And then we started talking and I was like, you know what? I have a fund now and I want to invest in you. I've seen, I've seen what you can do. And we've done a lot of work together, you know, on being yourself is one thing. Um, yes. Also in managing family, when you come from, you know, diverse communities um, or communities where families are very important. Mm-hmm. Um, like I talk about this in the book a lot about how I need buy-in from my family, mm-hmm. like to, to do stuff. I have a six-year-old. Like I have to have buy-in, even from him. I get buy-in from him. Yes. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it just it's it makes my life easier. It yeah. makes um, my life richer to mm-hmm. have buy-in from them and and to also allow them to to participate, like bring them into this world too. Yeah. And so I talk a lot about that, particularly with women and particularly with women of color founders. Of, yes. Yeah really bringing your family in like let make yeah, it that. that your family don't like they want to help they for the most part your family wants to see you win yes. they may not have any idea of of how to do that and so do a lot of work but not just her but all our portfolios on that and i always tell the story of um prior to starting digital divided i started one of the first early lifestyle fashion blog blogs and it became really successful and it scaled it and there was one time where I needed a videotape of myself on mm-hmm. some TV show. Now, my grandparents have what I call the Catherine Library of right. like everything I've ever done <laughs> in my entire life. I'm not even joking. It's like my <laughs> grandfather had to like organize. Yeah. And so it was someplace they were like, do you think you can get a tape or how can we find a tape? And I was like, I know exactly the place to get it. And so I call my grandparents. I'm like, okay, do you guys have this tape? Do you have like, can you go in the vault? Like, do you have this tape on this day? And it was five years ago. And my grandfather was like, I do. And, you know, I had to send FedEx to them and I had to explain to FedEx, you know, they're elderly. So like, you know, you yeah. might have to walk them through. <laughs> like, like how much of this process can we do? Because I just want them to have to drop it in, you know. Yeah. And but but my grandfather loved that because he mm. got to help me. He wanted to he got to be a part of it. Yeah. And, I think, you know, finding ways for our parents or our loved ones or whomever they be friends or family to get involved in what we're doing. Yes. Um, especially yeah. those who really want to see us win. Yes. It's, yeah. Like we, it, it it serves you to do that. Yes. It's a, it's a, you, I'm, I'm, you're coaching me right now. <laughs> you don't even know it. You're coaching me. Because if I look at the personal advisory board, that that is incredibly powerful for everybody, not yeah. just not just leaders, right? And we bottle so yeah. much in. Sometimes that it's detriment to how we, oh, it's detriment ultimately to our health and our happiness, Mm -hmm. but detriment to how we move forward every single day. The other thing that you really shared is the idea of just be yourself. Yeah. You you know, you've got so much to offer as you are. Don't change for anyone. Yeah. And the family one for me really resonates because sometimes it's hard to communicate with your family because they don't really understand what you're doing. <laughs> how you're doing yeah. it all. They don't understand how you're going to bed with the stresses. They don't understand how you're waking up with the same pressure. And as leaders, that's what we do every day. We're, we're waking up with the idea of 
what happens if, right? Oh, if, and I've got to do these million things. And then when we get the family, it's more about, hey, how's Jimmy? How's Mary? And how's everybody? Well, no, it's actually if you bring them into that space and the more you share, the thing I love about this, because my mother's exactly the same as your mother in the sense that she loves to add value. She loves to contribute. She would do anything because she, she, I'm glad I can still help. And yeah, you can just yeah. feel it in her voice and her body. But now let's look at all of our family members the same way. Yeah, and no, totally. Yeah. And now my mom is really great at tech. She's, like, got all these cell phones. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I'm, like, I'm yeah. loving it. Like, she's, yeah. like, but I think giving our family the opportunity to help us um, I love that. Because you're gonna need, you're gonna need help building this. You cannot build this by yourself. No one builds yeah. anything great by themselves. Like yeah. period in a discussion. Yeah. You have to have people around you. You have to have a team of people. Um, there's no value in being a martyr. Martyrs, as I always say, martyrs end up dead. Yeah. So like maybe there's not. Maybe not. Let's not like be a martyr if we don't have to. Be yeah. A yeah. Now, build the damn thing. Can I just ask something before we touch on, because you've, you've actually referenced yeah. some really cool points from the book. Um, I'm going to ask you a personal, I'm not going to ask you a personal question. And by the way, if, you, if, you, if you're not comfortable in answering, that's totally okay. Um, we all have examples of things that didn't work well for us. And it really shaped our views and our thinking. And, and you've obviously, you know, gone through a lot in your own time and, and, and your mother went through a lot and your, your family before went through a lot. And if you've got an example of you for you personally that you'll be willing to share and obviously it, it, and how it motivated you to, to do what you're doing? You know, there's so much. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like in terms of like things that I have learned and I look at all the, the challenges as learning experiences. Yeah. I really, really do. I think, um, you know, with my first company, I didn't realize, it. I learned a lesson about selling when people are interested. Um, and so I had offers to buy the company. I didn't sell because I didn't actually know that there were other options. I only thought you keep it or you sold it. I didn't right. know there was like a, a gray area. And at the time I was doing things, there were no mentors. Like, Ironically enough, in the U United States, I'm actually part of the first generation of mentors in this space. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, like, like, so there isn't, there wasn't anybody I could exactly turn to mm -hmm. to ask for help or thought process behind it. And so I sold my company. I did very well, but I sold it for less than what I would have if I would have right. sold it at peak. And one of the things I realized was like how much uh, at challenges I had around money. You're right. You know, growing up in resource poor communities where. We're, we have all these messages about money that is just like crazy. And also just in general, America has a lot of just crazy messages around money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like that is not the same in other parts of the world. Um, and so I realized I had all of this like stuff around money. Um, and when the wire came through for, you know, the company, I didn't touch it for like a week right. because I realized I was afraid. Like I was literally afraid. This was like, is this my money? Like I'd never seen that many zeros before yeah. in my entire life. And it was yeah. in account with my name on it. And yeah. it was, is this mine? Like, I don't know. Like, what do I do with it? Is it, do I trust that it's still here? Like all of these different things. And I realized, you know, how that impacted my decisions in business. It really did. Yes. Um, yeah. And started to, to work through that. But that was one area I would definitely say that was really deeply challenging. Yes. Um, I think also motherhood and trying to balance that and running anything. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's your children have a way of like bringing you to a place that no one else can bring you to. Yes. Um, yep. And forcing you to stop and look yep. <laughs> like whether you want to or not, they will force you to in some way. And, you know, I had a moment with my son where he was like very angry because I was on my phone too much. And I was, and he needed me to be present. Yes. And to be perfectly honest, I needed to be present. Yes. Like, but 
he let me know and he was five and he took my phone and threw it across the room and broke the phone <laughs> and i was like and he got my attention and he was <laughs> and he had every right and he and and what's startling is like he's so not an angry little boy so that's why it like whoa it was like whoa like he you know is very much not that and so you know i think making sure that i stay present making sure that i bring my family in uh, so yeah, yeah. I let them know what I'm doing. Like I said, you yeah. know, mommy's going to be traveling this week. I'm going to be here. I'll be back on Monday. Do you have any questions? Like, yeah. you know, I'm going to, and so, so he knows what I'm doing. He knows that I'm away. He knows that I'm working. It's not like I'm, he, he, I bring him with me sometimes. So I'm doing yeah. a speech in San Diego. Yeah. He's coming with me. Yeah. Because awesome. now when I'm speaking, he uh -huh. knows what I'm doing. So if I say I'm going to give a talk, he actually has a reference to understand what that means. I'm going to give you a quick, two quick examples personally because you, you, you touch my heart um, because, you know, our, our family and our children are the most precious yeah. thing we have. My son, and I, I'm talking a little while ago, um, a, de a, a decade ago, I, I, um, I'm going to just share a quick story about my son and my daughter because we did two things. About a decade ago, I was travelling a lot to Asia uh, every second week on a plane, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, and, and just kept on going. And my son, who was three at the time, was getting anxiety issues. Mm. It was a separation anxiety. Yeah. And my wife and I sat down, and I remember coming back from a treatment, and she goes, that was really hard the other day. He, he howled for a long time. And I said, this isn't a discussion. I said, yeah. traveling work is secondary to what family is about. And you know what was interesting? You, you said it up front. I don't think we were communicating well enough yeah. on trying to set an expectation of what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell the Uber story. Um, Uber was an interesting transition for us because when he got to see the car and the car was four or five minutes away, he could actually process that dad was going to leave. And yeah. by the time the car... Yeah. Dad, it's in Gordon Street. Dad, it's here. Dad, and, and then in the end, it'll be, Dad, have a great trip. Yes, exactly. Mentally process it in a way that, well, that's what my dad does or well, that's what my mum does. And, yeah. and, and by the way, I did get off the plane. Uh, my wife and I made that decision. I was, I was surrounded by amazing people who just said, you know, stay in Australia, do your thing, and, but you're not yeah. leaving. <laughs> and I, I was very blessed uh, that way where, where I was at the time. And then the secondary side to that was I took my daughter to a tennis tournament once mm -hmm. and uh, to the Australian Open yeah. uh, about three years ago, four years ago. And then what, what I actually did with all the other people that I invited, I said, bring your child. And so all of the executives brought their child. And you know how many out of the six that came said, probably three said, I wasn't going to come. Do you know how many invitations I get like this? Mm -hmm. And then when you talk, you, you said you're bringing your daughter. They just bought all of their children, ranging from two to twelve to eighteen, and, yeah. and my daughter, who's an introvert, she was sharing, she was yeah. telling funny stories, and I went, "This is life, this is what it's about," and that that part of the journey was was really important. That's what I hope comes out of this pandemic, is yeah. that we understand the importance of that we recognize our own humanity and we mm -hmm. recognize in the others. And that we don't get so wrapped up into whatever business goal that we don't realize at the end of the day, this is all about human beings. Yes. Like we all have a very short period on this world. Um, and what do we want to do with it? And who do we want to spend time with? And how do we want our legacy to be? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, really, I'm hoping that we can, this pause that we all had. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm hoping that we, we take that from it and not go back to the way things were before. Right. Yeah. And so, and even um, with this trip, it's like two, my son's gonna miss two days of school. And I was like, oh God, I don't know. Cause you know, previously it would be like, never take, I mean, that was like, and I'm like, you know, they're shutting down schools like left and right, like every couple of days in Chicago with no notice to parents. I'm like this is an opportunity for him to get a different type of learning. I mean, obviously he's not going to, you know, miss anything that's like, uh, ex extraordinarily mm -hmm. important yeah. and I'm like why are we still stuck on that rule yeah. like he could yeah. also do video school because we've all learned that that could happen right yeah. and so I think it's just like really letting go of these sort of 
um, things that we had constructed before. We're in a vastly different world. Yes. And one of the things that I've tried to do, particularly as a leader um, with my own team, but also as I communicate with others, is to recognize that, you know, a lot of people are also in a bit of a mourning period right now. Mm. They're mourning the world we used to have and the yeah. way life used to be. Yeah, it's a good one. And to give grace to that. Um, and so I even see with, you know, in America, they're starting to bring people back to work. And I'm like, why? You yeah. know, like, and, and because the American economy um, has been doing really well. Maybe yes. some people would say too well, we're in a yeah. period of inflation <laughs> now. But like, you know, obviously we've learned that people can be productive by not being in the office, maybe yes. even more productive. Yeah. So why are you bringing people back in? It is because you have these structures that existed that you desperately want to go back to, but there's no reason to go back to those yeah. structures yeah. anymore. And, and so what I'm hoping is that we rethink some things. Mm. I'm hoping that I'm keeping my fingers crossed, um, whether it be, you know, concepts of space, yeah. which is the whole idea of you have home, work in your play space and we used to have these three separate spaces particularly in the in the american context we really yes. had three separate spaces and they all collapsed instantly at once during the pandemic and my hope is that we rethink concepts of space yes yeah we rethink work yes. what does that mean even for my team someone was like oh are you going to get a a um an office and I said, well, why? Like, yeah. like, why? Like, we, we, instead of getting an office, what we actually do is we spend money on having really great staff retreats. Mm -hmm. We usually do two to three retreats a year. We go someplace nice. Yeah, nice. Like, you know, what, what well, would be... what you just said. It's rethinking. That? It's rethinking. rethinking how we work, rethinking how we balance, also rethinking what's important. What's important? Yeah. And you know what we do on our retreats? And this, I think, is really unique. And um, I'm an Aspen fellow, and I was talking to some other Aspen folks, and they thought I was probably like unicorn or something like kooky. <laughs> I said, we don't actually do any business there. Yeah. Right. We, we do personal development, team development, but we don't do any business, any pitches. We don't talk about anything like that. And the reason why we don't is because we spend so much time in Zoom yes. doing work yeah. That when we're together, I want us to like learn about each other, like connect mm -hmm. with each other, spend yeah. that time being in each other's presence. Yeah. All the stuff that you would get if you had an office. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. And then I also think Amazing. too, uh, the other response I had is like, I'm not going to ask people to move because people during the two years have been able to create the lives that they want. I'm not going to ask them to give that up to arbitrarily come back when there's no reason why they need to come back. Like yes. if this is where you do your best, if you do your best work on the beach in Bali and you're giving incredible work, why would I want you to leave that? Yeah. If you're if you're incredibly productive and you. doing great work, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, which is why we have enormously high retention and um, we do have a lot of people who want to work with us. Like we really, really do. This is beautiful. And and, and it's, it, it's sort of... Um, one of the early ideas, I mean, I gave you a bit of a taste of the Asia traveling around a lot and I came to the conclusion, two things. Well, even when you travel, you're not always adding value. Yeah, you're yeah. adding less value to the people that really matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people that love and care and also people that need you work-wise. So it was a, a sort of an early embryo creation of a thought, well, how do you lead when you're not in the same room? But then how do you enable a very simple and connected framework that we can all just get focused on yeah. what that is and get the right things done? So we spend less time on the wrong things and more times on the right thing, more, more time on the right things at work, but more importantly, more times on the things that we really truly love and are really important beyond work. And if we can get the balance of those two things, uh, and that's what we're aspiring to do um, right now. To, to piggyback on that, one of the things we talk about in the book is I talk about creating your own personal core values, like mm -hmm. actually listening out, but also before you get started on building your company, write out the company's core values. Yeah. Like what is it that your company stands for? Mm -hmm. And don't write it just because some, you know, executive coach or consultant told you to do it. But like, what is it at the end of the day you want people 
to believe about your company? Yeah. What do you want them to believe about you as, as the leader? And so for us, when I talk about being human, that's like our number one core value is actually be human. That's, that's the core mm-hmm. value of like, and recognizing everyone's humanity and that we're all coming at this from all different ways. But I found that spending time um, doing the core values and we did the work with an amazing um, executive coach named Valeska Toro, who actually used to be my chief of staff when I was at Digital Divide and she right. left to create her own amazing company is that it created this foundation in a very uncertain world. It, it created something that staff members, partners, others could hold on to. Yes. And the reason why I did that is we created, you know, Genius Scale was founded during the pandemic. And I said, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I cannot make promises on certain things in terms of the markets. I have no idea. America's markets are like all over the map. Yes. Like yeah. all over the map. <laughs> like yeah. each day it's a different thing. But what I can promise is these core values. So instead of centering your work with us based upon your job description, Mm -hmm. what I want you to do is center it on this core values because your job may change. It probably will change. Yes. Yeah. And so, but if, but know these core values are not going to change. Know that we are all deeply committed, including myself to these core values. And that's where you can find the security in your job is on those, not on like other stuff that really is arbitrary and that we can't even control. We can control those core values and how we live them. Well, the thing I love that you're also allowing everyone, not just to understand the core values, but get them to make their own decision. Exactly. Values that live inside me. Now I've got it. Let's move. And the other thing you touched on there as well, which was another article I was reading yesterday actually was around, you know, companies of today just have to be highly flexible. Yes. And if we haven't created that flexible framework and that flexible working environment, you're ultimately going to lose in some way, shape or form. Uh, you seem to already be there. Again, you're ahead of the time in the way that you... You know what, I think, and, and, you know, as a CEO, you probably know this is too, I think this was the first time that corporations had to actually think about the home life mm. of their employees. I mean, like, really think about it. Not like, oh, we can't... Like, your ability to do your job was based upon the infrastructure of your home, both yeah. mental, physical infrastructure of your home. Mm-hmm. And you had companies that had to finally think about what happens to you after 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what, where do you go? Like, what's your life? Like, you were actually getting peeks into people's homes, right? Yeah. Like, you're able to see, oh, my God, you're just at a, you're, there's your cat. Or in my case, Physically. his son's behind you in his underwear, like, dancing, because he could always sit, he could sense a, a Zoom was happening. He could yeah. spill it in his bones. And so he knew it was, like, <laughs> entertainment. But but it's the first time companies actually have to think about that, right? Yeah. Like, what what does this person do at five? Yeah. What does their home look like? Do they actually have a desk at home to do work? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. what is what what is that? Do they have an office? Like all of these sort of things, companies actually have to think about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and my hope is again that the fact that the corporations have to see their employees as human beings and not just marks somewhere. I'm hoping that this is going to sh- do a shift yes. in how corporate America works with employees and partners. Yeah. That is my hope. That yes. is my hope. Um, because we got a glimpse of everyone's life in the past two years. Yeah. No, we absolutely we don't know what, right. And we don't know what, what type of struggles or triumphs people are having. Um, yeah. and, and maybe we never thought about it until we have to think about it. And, and now I'm hoping that that sort of empathy, that corporate empathy, if that's a, could be a word, uh, I'm it, hoping that that continues. Yeah. I, I just love everything you're saying because I think historically, and I, actually I, I had somebody on who was actually, uh, your, your mother's age. Uh, and my mother's age is the same age. And, um, and she, was, she, she just blew my mind. And one thing she brought my attention to and really taught me is that we're still trying to run traditional 400-year-old leadership practices. We're still yeah. trying to everybody is the same. This is what you should do. You have core response. No, this is actually how do we all rally around and start to agree. People have strengths and we let's push everyone and then surround everyone with the areas to improve. Sure. 
but don't have expectations that they're just going to do everything you told them they're going to do because they may not have the skill sets. And so uh, to me, this whole idea of thinking differently, yeah. how you've positioned it, is just beautiful. Um, and I, I would like to think, well, I know if I'm going into the, the employment market and my children are about to go yeah. into the next generation imp- employment market, I'm, I'm coaching them on the same values. Yeah, yep. around yourself in a way where you feel valued, where you understand what you're doing, and you truly do believe in everyone with you. Um, and, and that sort of will, up, will shape the way that they think about it. And if companies aren't there, they will lose out on good talent. And I think one of the things that may be hard for certain people to make the shift to is that employees get to choose you. Mm. Mm. And I think for a long time, it's been, well, this is what we need, but what is it that they need? Like, yeah. Are you giving them, in fact, what it is that they need and that they get to choose you? One of the things I always say at Genius Guild is we all choose to be here. No one mm-hmm. has to be here. We yes. all choose to be here. and We all choose to be in partnership in doing this work. We all do. Yeah. And, and so and there's a responsibility when you choose to be in a space. Yes. Like there's a responsibility there. And I think what I have noticed is that companies are not doing a really good job of that, of understanding because, again, they're still holding in onto that old dichotomy of I'm the employer. I get to say, and they all want my job. And like, well, no, they don't. Like um, one thing I will, I will, I know we're headed towards the end of time, but one thing I'll share is, you know, what's happening here in the U S I think it might be happening globally too. Um, there is a real challenge in finding workers, mm. particularly at entry-level positions and then service-level positions, right? Mm. In fast food and groceries and things like that. Now, one of the interesting things that has happened is if you were an 18-year-old um, young Black guy who was growing up in the South Side of Chicago, um, who maybe didn't graduate from high school, or just graduated from, from high school, yeah. the only job options you had prior to the pandemic, prior to the past couple of years, was to work um, in these fast food grocery stores, yeah. where, which could be pretty exploitive, right? You weren't yes. making yeah. a lot of money. There was like really no room for growth. What happened was during the pandemic, a lot of these workers found out that they could be mini entrepreneurs, become mini yeah. influencers. Yeah. Yeah. They could create their own companies, which yeah. I think is like amazing. So you have all these like mini sort of influencers or micro influencers. Yes. Yeah who are making significantly more money a week working for themselves than they are working for a Taco Bell or whatever company. And they don't have to work for you. And they don't have to work for your really low, horrible wages. They don't have to do that anymore. They are choosing not to do that. And so it's a really interesting phenomenon happening here because now you have um, the Starbucks, the McDonald's of the world offering things that he should have been offering 20 years ago, which is um, tuition reimbursement. Yes, They're yes. offering health care. They doubled the salaries. Yeah. They are like doing all these things that they should have done yeah. before. Yes. And yeah. Do. yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so, so the book, Build the Damn Thing, because we are going, we're going to wrap up now, but I'd love to just uh, close by talking about the book around build the damn thing, how to start a successful business if you're not a rich white guy, that drops on the 7th of June. Uh, I think Americans say June 7, we say 7th of June in our uh, our English. Yeah, yeah. Um, So talk to us about who's going to get the most value out of this and and what audience are you looking to bring to reading the book? So it's actually, it's really interesting. I think there's a wide swath of people. I mean, obviously entrepreneurs who are women, who are people of color, who aren't rich, um, which is basically like 99% of the world, would get a lot of it out of it. It's interesting. One of the people who endorsed the book is Steve Case. Steve was the founder of AOL. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was reading the book and he's like, you know, I am actually a rich white guy, but I'm actually learning a lot <laughs> about it because he's an investor. How interesting you say yeah. that because when I was thinking about the question, yeah. My thought here, it's actually attractive for everyone because mm-hmm. we get to listen and learn from a completely different lens. Yeah. It's really he invested in a number of people of color and he was like, this is the first time, book I've read where I get now the challenges. Like, yep. 
Like I'm actually able, he's like, I'm able to be a better investor, even though I'm a rich white guy, because now I see the process and I see mm-hmm. the challenges. And I said, this is amazing if you got that from that book, because one of the hardest things is the layers that we have to go through. And I talk about this in the book of like how to navigate these sort of layers when you're an other. And then when you're an other, 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 and the more yeah. otherness you have, the harder it is to navigate in, in this entrepreneurial space. And so really excited about the book. It is a how-to manual. It's meant to be read many times. It's meant to be marked up. It's also funny. Yeah. Um, it's very much like, it, someone's like, this is Catherine on paper. I was like, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's very funny. Uh, I tell like stories. I talk, I mean, about everyone from, you know, um, Beyonce, a whole big story about Beyonce and how she became famous and the, and the challenges Beyonce had to go through. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you don't think of Beyonce having to go through challenges, but she had to go through challenges all the way to having quotes from BTS. I mean, like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and even talking about them and how they became, you know, um, pretty successful, like startup owners. Yes. Who would have thought BTS were startup owners, but they are. And so it really is for anyone who's looking to build something, um, who wants to know how to get started and not get started in the sense of like, here, go build, build your minimal viable product. But like, what's the actual first mental step? Yeah. Like, who do, who do you actually need to have on your team? How do you avoid some of the pitfalls? Yes. Um, I have a whole section on how to fire someone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And how hard that is. Yes. And how do you center your you center your humanity and center their humanity? And how do you do it in a way that's graceful as, or as graceful as possible? Yes. Also, how to hire and yeah. how to make sure that you center your core values and let that dictate who you hire and who you don't hire. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's been very, very helpful for us. I can tell you, I use the core values in practice. It has helped enormously in hiring. It's helped enormously. So I think the way I, and I can't wait to read it, and I'm, I'm absolutely going to get on ordering it straight away, uh, pre-ordering, I mean. Uh, so everyone pre-order this book because it, it, it obviously talks about the cultural element of, of Catherine's background and what you do and how you inspire others um, in, in, in the black community. But also, to me, it, there's just a lot of coaching around the frameworks when you start with mental family and then what to do. Um, that's yeah. Awesome. And I think it also does elevate the education level as yeah. well. And it was a, a totally different topic, also another social issue that we've got uh, globally uh, with young children and bullying and things like that. Mm-hmm. But the idea of the first thing we need to do is talk about it. We need to educate. We need to yeah. have the open communities and the open collaboration on it. And this is absolutely another. And not uh, be afraid to have the tough conversations. Yeah. Like about you know, all the different things that we have going on in society, like don't run away from it. The, the one thing I'll leave you with is um, we, you know, in 2016, we had a pretty interesting election here in the United mm-hmm. States, which yes. was yes. Donald yes. Trump, Trump, which, um, and I had a friend, um, still my friend, who is a very successful, like white guy in New York City. And he called me, I was living in Atlanta at that point, And he was like very upset. Yeah. very upset and he's like what are we gonna do and blah 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 and I let him kind of like you know go on for like about two minutes and I said you know what look you have privileges I will never have you mm-hmm. will get through doors I will never get through you will be invited you are invited to tables I will never be yeah. invited to say that yeah. you are like Prince Harry you have this privilege is given to you as a birthright Mm-hmm. You can't even get rid of it, even if you wanted to. People just give it to you. Yeah. So yeah. seeing that you can't get rid of it, use it. Like yeah. you, yeah. you can, you are powerful. And I say that to anyone who maybe thinks, well, you know, I'm not a person of color. I don't know what to do. This is all overwhelming. It's like you have power that you don't even know that you have and use it. Like bring someone with you who you normally don't see. If you notice you're in a room and it's all men, Next time, make sure you bring a woman with you. Yes. You can totally do it. Have her sit right next to you and then yeah. say, you know, Susie is going to lead the meeting. I'm going to sit like she's, le- and then watch how everyone That's starts to like change, now right? Action. Yeah, fantastic. Lean into the privilege. And he had said to me something I hadn't even recognized, which is 
he never, he was always looking ahead. He was like saying, I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm not Bill Gates. But he never saw that he was ahead of like, you know, a whole bunch of other people. He never yeah. looked back to realize, oh my gosh, like I'm in this position because I'm only, I just know that I'm not Bill Gates. Yes. Yeah. And he didn't see that he was better, you know, had yes. more, not better, but had a better position than everyone else. Yeah. And so use your privilege. You are absolutely amazing. So thank you very much for joining us. Go thank out, grab the book, build the damn thing. Also your podcast as well, uh, which I'm subscribe, which I'm subscribing to. Um, but thank you very much for sharing your journey. Thank and you. your, oh, you're, you're awesome. You really are. And I will close out by saying Catherine was also, she 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 come, become part of my family. When you shared with me, you played rugby. I did. I was second row. That and is then so I cool. played eight man for a little bit, yeah. but mostly second row. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool because my 11 year old's about to start on the journey of contact rugby, uh, which oh, I know her grandmother is very horrified by and is going to have a chat with <laughs> um, But oh, She'll uh, be fine. You know what? Tell, tell her grandmother she will grow up to be a venture capitalist. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I shared with you, I always said she'd be the CEO of Jager's Enterprise one day. Exactly. She's going to grow up to like be a CEO. Tell, tell yeah, her that. Exactly right. Cool. Hey, Catherine, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah. That was absolutely amazing. I appreciate you. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you.